Ed Sheeran. Happy first Thursday of the month. Every first Thursday of the month, I upload a new episode of a brand new series I started earlier this year called Zodiac Serial Killers. I upload an episode about a serial killer that corresponds to the zodiac sign of that month. So for example, it is November. Today we're talking about a Scorpio serial killer. I started this back with Aries, so you can go ahead and binge that playlist. It's literally titled Zodiac Serial Killers, and you can of course catch a new episode of this next Thursday, the first Thursday of December. Fair warning, today's video is a long one. I'm not even gonna say grab some snacks and grab some tea. I'm gonna say like grab a whole meal and grab some snacks and grab some tea and get ready for this one. So if you want to see more videos like this, give us a thumbs up and let me know in the comments below. Make sure to follow my Instagram, my Twitter, and my TikTok so you have a say in my videos, get a chance to be in them, and even get to be shout out of the day. I don't do this content often except when it comes to spooky season. So spooky season just ended. October was last month. Depending when you're watching this, you can watch all my spooky content related videos in my spooky videos playlist. But now before we get into our Scorpio serial killer, I do want to give you a warning. Again, I'm literally talking about a serial killer. This might make you uncomfortable. It might trigger you. You just might not enjoy hearing this. So this is your warning. Now today's serial killer is, here's the best part, he's not even a serial killer, but he is one of the most disturbing men in American history, and that is Charles Manson. Charles Millis Manson was born on November 12th of 1934, and he was an American criminal who led the Manson family, a cult, in California in the 1960s. Some of the members committed a series of murders at four different locations in July and August of 1969. While Manson himself never directly committed the murders, his ideology constituted an act of conspiracy. Charles Manson was born as Charles Millis Maddox on November 12, 1934, in Cincinnati, Ohio. His mother was 16-year-old Kathleen Maddox, both an alcoholic and a prostitute. It's possible Manson's biological father was a man named Colonel Walker Henderson Scott Sr. Kathleen filed a fraternity suit against him in 1937. Scott worked in the local mills and had a reputation as a con artist. He allowed Kathleen to believe that he was an army colonel, although Colonel was his given name. When Kathleen told him that she was pregnant, he told her he had been called away on army business. After several months, she realized he wasn't returning. This man died in 1954, and Charles may never have met his biological father. In August 1934, before Manson's birth, Kathleen married a man named William Eugene Manson, who worked in the dry cleaning business. Kathleen often went drinking with her brother Luther, leaving Charles Manson with several babysitters. William divorced Kathleen, and Charles kept his last name, Manson. On August 1st of 1939, Kathleen and her brother were arrested for assault and robbery. Kathleen was sentenced to five years in prison, and her brother was sentenced to 10. Manson was sent to live with an aunt and uncle in West Virginia. His mother was paroled in 1942. Manson later said that the first week that she returned from prison was one of the happiest times of his life. After her release, Manson's family moved to Charleston, West Virginia, where Charles continuously ditched school and his mother spent her evenings drinking. She was arrested for grand larceny, but not convicted. The family later moved to Indianapolis. In an interview, Manson said that he set his school on fire when he was nine. Manson also got in trouble for skipping and petty theft. When he was 13 in 1947, he was sent to an Indiana school for male delinquents run by Catholic priests. Gibault was a very strict school where punishments included being beaten with a wooden paddle or a leather strap. Manson ran away from school and slept in the woods, under bridges, and wherever else he could find shelter. Manson fled home to his mother and spent Christmas of 1947 at his aunt and uncle's house. His mother returned him to school. Ten months later, he ran away to Indianapolis. While there in 1948, Manson committed his first known crime by robbing a grocery store. He intended to just steal food to have something to eat, but he found over a hundred dollars in a cigar box and took the money. He used the money to rent a room on Indianapolis's Skid Row and to buy food. For a bit, Manson tried to live a crime-free life by working for Western Union delivering messages. However, he was caught supplementing wages through petty theft, and in 1949, a judge sent him to a juvenile facility in Omaha, Nebraska. After four days at Boys Town, he and a fellow student, Blackie Nielsen, obtained a gun and stole a car. They used it to commit two armed robberies on their way to Nielsen's uncle's house in Peoria, Illinois. Nielsen's uncle was a professional thief, and when the boys arrived, he allegedly took them on as their apprentices. Manson was arrested two weeks later during a nighttime raid. He was linked to his two earlier armed robberies and sent to Indiana Boys School, a strict reform school. At the school, a staff member allegedly encouraged students to rape Manson and repeatedly beat him. He ran away from the school 18 times. While at the school, he created a self-defense technique he called the insane game. When he was physically unable to defend himself, he would screech and wave his arms like crazy to convince his aggressors that he was crazy. He escaped with two other boys in February of 1951. The three were robbing gas stations while trying to drive to California in stolen cars. They were arrested in Utah. Since driving a stolen car across state lines was a federal crime, Manson was sent to Washington, D.C.'s National Training School 
school for boys. He was given an aptitude test which determined that he was illiterate but had an above average IQ of 109. His caseworker deemed him as aggressively antisocial. Manson was transferred in October 1951 to National Bridge Honor Camp, a minimum security institution. His aunt visited him and told administrators that she would let him stay at his house and she would help him find jobs. Manson had a parole hearing scheduled for February of 1952. He was caught raping a boy at knife point in January, the month before. Manson was transferred to the Federal Reformatory in Petersburg, Virginia. There he committed eight serious disciplinary offenses, three involving homosexual acts. He was then moved to a maximum security reformatory in Ohio. He was to remain there until his release on his 21st birthday in November of 1955. Good behavior got him out on early release in May of 1954, and he went to live with his aunt and uncle in West Virginia. In January of 1955, Manson married a hospital waitress named Rosalie Jean Willis. They moved to Los Angeles in a car Manson stole in Ohio. Three months after arriving in LA, Manson was again charged with the federal crime of taking a stolen car across state lines. He was given five years probation. He failed to appear at a Los Angeles hearing on a similar charge filed in Florida, so he was arrested in Indianapolis in March of 1956. His probation was revoked, and he was sentenced to three years imprisonment at Terminal Island in Los Angeles. While Manson was in prison, Rosalie gave birth to their son, Charles Manson Jr. During his first year at Terminal Island, Rosalie and Manson's mother actually lived together so they would visit him often. In March of 1957, his wife stopped visiting him. His mom informed him that his wife was living with another man. Less than two weeks before a scheduled parole hearing, Manson tried to escape by stealing a car. He was given five years probation and his parole was denied. Manson got five years parole in September of 1958, the same year that Rosalie got divorced from him. By November, he was pimping out a 16-year-old girl and relying on the support from another girl and her wealthy parents. In September of 1959, he pleaded guilty to a charge of attempting to cash a forged U.S. Treasury check, which he claimed he stole from a mailbox. The charge was later dropped. He received a 10-year suspended sentence and probation after a young woman named Leona, who had an arrest record for prostitution, made a tearful plea before the court. She said her and Manson were deeply in love and would marry if Charlie were freed. Before the end of the year, she did marry Manson, possibly so she wouldn't be required to testify against him. Manson took Leona and another woman to New Mexico for prostitution, resulting in him being held in question for violating the Mann Act, a federal law that criminalizes the transportation of any woman or girl for the purpose of prostitution. He was released, but when he disappeared in violation of his probation, a warrant was issued. One of the women was arrested for prostitution, and Manson was arrested in June of 1960 in Loreto, Texas. He was returned to Los Angeles, and for violating his probation on the check cashing charge, he was ordered to serve his 10-year sentence. In July of 1961, he was transferred from LA to Washington State. There, he took guitar lessons from a gang leader and really got into music. At the time, Manson's mother moved to Washington to be closer to her son. Manson began studying Scientology while incarcerated, and in July of 1961, Manson listed his religion as Scientology. Manson's September 1961 annual review noted he had a tremendous drive to call attention to himself, given the same observation in September of 1964. In 1963, Leona was granted a divorce from Manson and alleged that she had a child with him named Charles Luther. In June of 1961, Manson was sent for the second time to Terminal Island in preparation for early release. By the time of his release day on March 21st of 1967, he had spent more than half of his 32 years of life in prison and institutions. Telling the authorities that prison was his home, he actually requested to stay. Manson moved to Berkeley from Los Angeles, which could have been a probation violation. After calling the San Francisco Probation Office upon his arrival, he was transferred to Roger Smith, a researcher and federal probation officer. Until the spring of 1968, Smith worked at the Haight-Ashbury Free Medical Clinic, which Manson and his cult went to often. Roger Smith, as well as the clinic's founder, David E. Smith, received funding from the National Institutes of Health to study the effects of drugs like LSD on the counterculture movement in Haight-Ashbury. The clinic patients became subjects of their research, including Manson and his expanding group of mostly female followers. Manson received permission from Roger Smith to move from Berkeley to the Haight-Ashbury district in San Francisco. He first took LSD and would use it often in his time there. David Smith, who had studied the effects of LSD and rodents, wrote that the change in Manson's personality during this time was the most abrupt Roger Smith had observed in his entire professional career. Inspired by the free love philosophy in the Height Ashbury district, especially during the Summer of Love, Manson began preaching his own philosophy based on a mixture of the book Stranger in a Strange Land, the Bible, Scientology, Dale Carnegie, and the Beatles, which quickly earned him a following. Manson had already gained his first follower 
at the UC Berkeley campus, a librarian named Mary Bruner. He talked her into letting her sleep at her house and it quickly became permanent. He then met Lynette Squeaky Frum, a runaway teen, and convinced her to live with him and Mary Brunner. Manson soon began to attract large crowds of listeners and dedicated followers. He targeted individuals from manipulation who were emotionally insecure and social outcast. LSD researcher David Smith claims that Manson attempted to reprogram their minds to submit totally to his will through the use of LSD and unconventional sexual practices. This would turn his followers into empty vessels that would accept anything he poured. By the end of his stay in Haight-Ashbury in April of 1968, Manson had attracted 20 or so followers, all under the supervision of his parole officer Roger Smith and the medical clinic. The core members of Manson's following, also known as the Manson family, consisted of Charles Tex Watson, Bobby Beausoleil, Mary Brunner, Susan Atkins, Linda Casabian, Patricia Krenwinkel, and Leslie Van Hoon. Manson grew his family through drug use and prostitution. Manson was arrested on July 31st of 1967 for attempting to prevent the arrest of one of his followers, Ruth Ann Morehouse. He was given three additional years of probation. In July of 1968, the Manson family were arrested while moving from San Francisco to Los Angeles when their bus crashed into a ditch. The Manson family, including Brunner and Manson's newborn baby, were found sleeping naked by police. He avoided prosecution again. Afterwards, he was arrested again and released a few days later, this time on a drug charge. While gathering his cult following, Manson was a singer-songwriter who was struggling to make it in the LA music industry. In the summer of 1968, Manson thought he hit his big break when two of his family members, Patricia Krenwinkel and Ella Jo Bailey, were hitchhiking and were picked up by Dennis Wilson, the drummer of the Beach Boys. Wilson and Manson hit it off immediately. They hung out for a while, smoked some pot, and listened to some of Charles Manson's songs. Days after their first meeting, Manson and the family moved into Dennis Wilson's house. They all dropped acid and participated in group sex before gonorrhea began to spread. The Manson family cost Wilson $100,000 to maintain, and they even crashed his Ferrari. When Wilson took Manson to record at his studio, he introduced Manson to a record producer, Terry Melcher. Manson had a disagreement with the studio engineer and pulled a knife on them. Their friendship came to an abrupt end at the end of summer of 1968. In 1968, the Beach Boys recorded Manson's song, Cease to Exist, but they changed the name to Never Learn Not to Love, but without a credit to Manson. The only credit was Dennis Wilson. Afterward, Manson attempted to get a record label contract through Terry Melcher, but was unsuccessful. Manson would also often talk about the Beatles, especially their 1968 album. Manson felt guided by his interpretation of the Beatles lyrics and adopted the term Helter Skelter to describe an impending apocalyptic race war. According to Paul Watkins, a Manson family member, Manson's first use of the term was at a family gathering on New Year's Eve of 1968 at Myers Ranch near California's Death Valley. Manson and the family would create an album with songs whose messages would be as subtle as those that they heard in the Beatles songs. These subliminal messages and songs claimed that there would be a race war between blacks and whites. Black men would lash out in violent crimes against the whites, then frightened whites would retaliate, and militant black people would provoke a war of mere extermination between racist white people and non-racist white people over the treatment of black people. Then the militant black people would arise to finish off the white people who survived and kill off all non-black peoples. Paul Watkins said that in this holocaust, the members of the Manson family would wait out the war in a secret city that was underneath Death Valley, which they would reach through a hole in the ground like a doomsday cult. They would be the only remaining whites when the war was over, and they would emerge from underground to rule the blacks who would be incapable of running the world. At that point, Watkins says Manson would become their leader. The term Helter Skelter was from the Beatles song of the same name, and Manson interpreted it as a concern with the race war. He convinced members of his cult that Beatles music, and particularly this song Helter Skelter, contained subliminal messages to commit violence. Manson and his followers began preparing for Helter Skelter in the months before they committed their first murders. They worked on songs for their album, which they anticipated would set off everything. They prepared vehicles and other items for their escape from LA to Death Valley when Doomsday 
arrived. Manson was convinced that the song at Helter Skelter contained a coded message of the route they should take. Manson's first attempted murder was in May of 1969. He shot a drug dealer named Bernard Lots of Papa Crow after a dispute over a drug payment. Crow survived. On July 31st of 1969, the body of Gary Hinman was found dead inside his own home. One of the Manson family members, Bobby Beausoleil, lived with Gary Hinman. Apparently there was a drug deal gone bad and Bobby wanted his money back. Manson was also under the impression that Gary Hinman had $20,000. So on July 25th of 1969, Manson ordered Bobby to go over to Hinman's and scare him enough to hand over the money. Susan Atkins and Mary Brunner accompanied Bobby. Both rumored to have had sex with Gary Hinman in the past. When he asked for the money, Gary Hinman admitted that he didn't have any. Bobby thought he was lying, roughed him up, and called for backup. The next day, Manson arrived at Hinsman's home with family member Bruce Davis. After Bobby told Manson that there was no money, Manson drew out a samurai sword and sliced Gary Hinman's cheek and ear. Manson and Davis took off in one of Gary Hinman's cars, leaving Bobby and the girls with Hinman. They tried to clean him up and stitch his wound with dental floss. Hinman insisted he didn't believe in violence and just wanted everyone to leave his house. Bobby began to panic, saying if he took them to the ER, he'd end up in prison and the Manson family would be in trouble. He spoke to Manson several times about what to do, then concluded that his only option was to kill Gary Hinman. They kept him hostage for three days, then Bobby stabbed Gary while the girls took turns smothering him with a pillow. Bobby wrote political piggy in Hinman's blood across the wall. He also drew a paw print on the wall in Hinman's blood in an attempt to convince that the Black Panthers had committed this crime and that they were instigating the race war that Manson had predicted. Bobby was arrested for the murder on August 6 and taken into custody. Manson feared that Bobby would crack under pressure and turn him in for the shooting of Crow and his involvement in the murder of Gary. Two other Manson family members, Mary Brunner and Sandra Good, were also arrested at the same time for using stolen credit cards. They were bailed, but their arrest on top of Bobby's was enough to send Manson in a spiral of rage. In early August of 1969, some Manson family members committed more murders in the Los Angeles area, beginning with the murder of actress Sharon Tate and four others in her home on August 8th and 9th of 1969. The murder of Sharon Tate and her friends had less to do with Sharon Tate and more to do with the address she lived at, 150 Cielo Drive. Music producer Terry Melcher had lived there. This is the man Manson was introduced to by the Beach Boys drummer, Dennis Wilson. This is also the same man that didn't give Charles Manson a record label contract. Melcher was renting the house at the time, but had moved out. When Manson went looking for Melcher, he found Tate instead. Despite his connection with the murders, Charles Manson actually did not murder anyone. On the night of August 8th, 1969, he sent Tex Watson, Susan Atkins, Linda Cassabian, and Patricia Krenwinkel to 150 Cielo Drive to totally destroy everyone in that house as gruesome as you can. Manson wanted these murders to make an even bigger impact than that of Gary's. He said, make it a real nice murder, just as bad as you've ever seen, and get all their money. On that night, Tate had filled her house with her friends. She was eight and a half months pregnant with a baby boy she was gonna name Paul. Her husband was out of town, so her friends decided to spend the night with her so she wouldn't be alone. Coffee company heiress Abigail Fogger and her boyfriend, aspiring screenwriter Wojciech Fikowski, were staying with Tate. So was Tate's ex-boyfriend and celebrity hairstylist, Jay Sebring and Stephen Parent, who first visited caretaker William Gerritsen at his guest house. Parent was the first to be killed. He was leaving when the Manson family came up on him in his car. Watson cut the phone line to the house and shot Parent four times in the chest and stomach, killing him. Watson woke up for Kosi, who was asleep on the couch, and told him, I'm the devil and I'm here to do the devil's business. Frakowski was stabbed 51 times. He tried to run outside and scream for help, but was shot twice. Severing tried to protect Tate, who was heavily pregnant and shot once for it. He was then stabbed seven times. Abigail Folger tried to give the Manson family all the cash she had on her, but was stabbed 28 times. Sharon Tate begged to live long enough to give birth to her baby boy, but instead the Manson family stabbed her 16 times. On the door of her home, they wrote the word pig in her blood. Manson wanted his followers to kill everyone at the home and make the killings look like the Gary Hinman killing. He wanted to make police think it was the Black Panthers and that Bobby was innocent. Also, Bobby wouldn't rat on Manson. The next day, housekeeper Winifred Chapman found the crime scene and called the police. Police took the only survivor, the caretaker, William Gerritsen, in for questioning. He stated Parent had visited him at around 11.30 and left shortly after, and he knew nothing else. 
he passed a polygraph test and was released. In the late night of August 10th of 1969, Rosemary LaBianca went to bed while her husband Lana LaBianca stayed up in the living room. Manson and his right-hand man, Tex Watson, were the first to enter the LaBianca house. They promised the couple they wouldn't be hurt or killed, just robbed. Manson left the house and instructed some of the girls waiting in the car outside, Patricia Krenwinkel and Leslie Van Hooten, to enter the house and murder the people inside. While the girls went to find Rosemary, Watson stood over Leno. He began to struggle and Watson stabbed him in the neck with a bayonet. In the bedroom, Rosemary fought back against the two girls. Van Hooten went back to the kitchen and brought back several utensils, including knives. Rosemary pleaded for her life, saying that they could take anything and she wouldn't call the police. Van Hooten held Rosemary down while Krenwinkel stabbed her in the neck. By the end of the struggle, Rosemary was stabbed 41 times. Krenwinkel admitted that after murdering Rosemary, she turned her attention to Leno and thought, you won't be sending your son off to war. She then carved the word war into his chest. Using blood from the victims, they wrote rise and death to pigs on the walls and a misspelled helter skelter on the refrigerator. Then the killers showered, pet the LaBianca's dogs, and left. Meanwhile, Manson got back in the car with getaway driver Linda Cassabian, who later became the prosecution's star witness. He handed her Rosemary's wallet and told her to drop it onto the sidewalk as soon as they arrived in a black neighborhood. Manson wanted a black person to find the wallet and use the credit cards so the police would think that they were the real LaBianca murderer. His plans changed and instead, he wanted Linda to pull over at a gas station about 20 miles from the home and leave the wallet in the woman's restroom. Linda hid it in the toilet tank the wallet wouldn't be found for another four months. The same night of the LaBianca murders, Manson sent family members, including Steve Grogan, to kill an actor Linda Cassabian and Sandra Good had met. Linda intentionally led the group to the wrong apartment, so no one else was killed that night. The next day, Leno and Rosemary's children discovered their bodies. LA police didn't think the crimes were linked, despite the identical bloody messages on the walls. They simply thought it was just a copycat killer. Police did raid the Manson family at Spawn Ranch, but on suspicion of a car theft. The family was released, and Manson relocated to Barker Ranch in Death Valley. Before they left Spawn Ranch, Manson ordered the killing of Donald Shea, a ranch hand who thought Manson had snitched on him to the police. He was killed on August 26. In October of 1969, many Manson family members were arrested, including Manson, for stealing RV equipment. By this point, the police had connected the dots between the two murders and linked them back to the murder of Hinman and Manson's involvement. On December 1st, police issued warrants for the five main participants in the Tate slash LaBianca murders. Manson, Watson, Atkins, Krenwinkel, and Van Hooten. A trial followed in 1971, full of outbursts for Manson and his followers. Manson showed up in court with a bloody X on his forehead to show he had been X'd out of society and that he doesn't follow the system. His followers did the same and even shaved their heads. Manson's X eventually turned into a swastika. Charles Manson was convicted on seven counts of first-degree murder for the Tate LaBianca murders, later followed by two more convictions for the death of Hinman and Shea. Manson, Watson, Atkins, Krenwinkel, and Van Hooten were all sentenced to death, though their death penalties were changed to life sentences the year later, since the following year the death penalty was abolished in California. Scattered members of the Manson family did not move on, and throughout the early 70s they continued to resort to violence and various levels of crime. On August 21st of 1971, Manson family members Mary Brunner, Catherine Gypsy Cher, Dennis Rice, Charles Lovett, Larry Bailey, and Kenneth Como raided an army supply store in southwest LA. The group stockpiled weapons while holding customers and employees hostage. Then they found themselves in a police shootout, resulting in Brunner and Cher being wounded. Authorities believe that their ultimate plan was to hijack a plane in order to ransom the captives for the release of the imprisoned Manson family members. During and after the Manson trial, other members of the family began a stint of petty crime, including robbery and identity theft. The group included Lynette Squeaky Frome and several couples, Michael Monfort and Nancy Pittman, James Spider Craig and Priscilla Cooper, and Mary Teresa Crystal Alonzo and her husband, a white supremacist named Bill Goocher. In 1971, the group befriended another couple named James and Lauren Willett. Later, both were found murdered due to the group's suspicion that James would snitch on them. In 1972, all the group's members except for Alonzo and Fromm were convicted or pleaded guilty to the double murders. The Willett's infant daughter survived. Alonzo, who had actually become a Manson follower after his arrest, was detained but not charged for the Willett murders. Two years later, in 1974, she was instead 
instead convicted in a plot to kidnap a foreign consul and hold them for ransom in exchange for freeing two prison inmates. Her current whereabouts are unknown. On September 5th of 1975, still loyal Manson supporter Squeaky attempted to assassinate President Gerald Ford. This was during a public appearance in Sacramento. She aimed a loaded Colt .45 at the president, but the gun didn't fire, and investigators later realized that there was no round in the chamber. She had originally wanted to assassinate the previous president, President Richard Nixon, because he had presided over the Manson trials. But after Nixon's resignation, she focused on his successor. For her crime, she was sentenced to life in prison, but she was released in 2009 at age 60, after which she became a friendly but reclusive real estate agent in upstate New York. In January 1st of 2017, Manson was being held at Corcoran Prison and rushed to the hospital for gastrointestinal bleeding. He returned to prison on January 6th. On November 15th of 2017, an unauthorized source claimed that Manson had returned to a hospital in Bakersfield. He died from cardiac arrest resulting from respiratory failure brought on by colon cancer at the hospital on November 19th of 2017. As for the rest of the Manson family members, Bruce Davis was convicted for his role in the murders of Gary Hinman and Donald Chea. He has been recommended for release several times, the latest in 2021. California Governor Newsom denied the request. Davis turned 78 in April of 2021. Leslie Van Hooten was convicted for her role in the murders of the LaBiancas. She is considered a model prisoner, earning her bachelor's and her master's degrees, while leading self-help groups for inmates. She has long since renounced Manson. She has been up for parole for more than 20 times, but rejected every single time. In November of 2020, Governor Newsom denied another request. She is now 72. Charles Tex Watson was the most vicious member of the Manson family. He was convicted for his involvement in the murders of Tate and her friends and the LaBianca murders. He's the one who killed Stephen Parent, Jay Sebring, and Leno LaBianca. He was denied parole in October of 2016 for the 17th time in 47 years. Watson is currently 75 and was denied parole at a hearing on October 15th of 2021. He isn't eligible again until October of 2026. Patricia Krenwinkel was convicted for the Tate slash LaBianca murders. She murdered Abigail Folger and helped murder Rosemary LaBianca. She is the one that stabbed Leno LaBianca and wrote Death to Pigs with his blood. She got her bachelor degrees and is involved with prison programs and has also renounced Charles Manson. She has been denied parole more than a dozen times. She is now 73 and her next parole hearing is scheduled for June of 2022. Susan Atkins was convicted for the Tate murders. She helped murder Sharon Tate and her unborn baby. She renounced Manson and became a born-again Christian. She also married twice while incarcerated and had a baby who was given up for adoption. In 2008, Atkins was diagnosed with brain cancer. As she was dying, she requested compassionate release but was denied. Atkins died in September of 2009 at age 61 after spending 38 years at the California Institution for Women in Chino. At the time of her death, she was the longest serving female inmate in the state of California. Now that title belongs to Patricia Krenwinkel. Bobby Beausoleil was convicted of Gary Hinman's murder. He continues to make music in jail. He is extremely regretful for killing Gary Hinman, someone he said was a friend. He was most recently denied parole in April of 2019, and his next parole hearing is scheduled for July of 2023. He is 73. Steve Clem Grogan was convicted for the murder of Donald Shea. He was also sent to kill an actor family members Linda and Sandra had met, but it didn't happen. He's also one that is believed to have crashed Dennis Wilson's the Beach Boys drummer, Ferrari. While in prison, Grogan got married and had two kids. He helped authorities recover Shea's remains, and in 1985, he was paroled, making him one of the few Manson followers to be released from prison. He lives in Northern California and plays music with bands. Linda Casabian accompanied the family on creepy crawls, in which they broke into homes and robbed them while the owners slept. She was the only member with a driver's license and was responsible for being the getaway driver at the Tate murders and the LaBianca murders. She testified against the family, saying that she tried to stop the murders. She left the car and saw Tex stabbing Fikoski and Krenwinkel chasing Abigail Fogler with a knife. Manson sent her and a group to kill an actor she had met with family member Sandra Good. The actor was Saladin Nader, but Linda led them to the wrong apartment so no one else was killed. She has since tried to live a quiet life with her children. 
She's 72. Mary Brunner accompanied Bobby and Susan to the home of Gary Hinman, but was not convicted for the murder. She received immunity for testifying against the others. On August 8th, hours before the Tate murders, Brunner and member Sandra Good were arrested for using stolen credit cards. She was arrested again in 1971 after the raid of a surplus store with several other family members. She was released in 1977, changed her name, and has then gone on to live a quiet, reclusive life reportedly in the Midwest. She had a son with Manson that was raised by his maternal grandparents. Sandra Good wasn't involved in the murders, but was arrested with Mary Brunner for using stolen credit cards. In 1975, she and follower Susan Murphy were arrested for sending nearly 200 hostile letters to various corporate executives. According to Helter Skelter, the letters threatened named corporate executives with death if they did not stop polluting the air and water and destroying the environment. Good represented herself in court and was sentenced to 15 years, though she only served 10. After she was released in 1985, she continued her infatuation with Manson. She wasn't allowed to return to California because of her parole, but when it ended, she moved to California to be closer to Charles Manson, although she was denied visiting privileges. At least until 2006, Good was still a loyal supporter, calling into talk shows to claim Manson's innocence. It's not clear where Good lives now. She is 77. Lastly, it's Paul Watkins. He would testify that on New Year's Eve of that year, 1968, Manson gathered the family to tell them about Helter Skelter. He also testified that Manson would encourage group LSD trips and take lower doses himself to keep his wits about him. Watkins said that Charlie's trip was to program us all to submit. Watkins did not maintain his devotion to Manson as much as the others and did not participate in the murders. Watkins continued to renounce Manson after the trial. He founded the Death Valley Chamber of Commerce, married twice, and had two children. He sadly died in 1990 of leukemia. And that is all I have on the Charles Manson family. So now you see why this video was so long, because it's not just only about Charles Manson, but it is because it's about the Manson family, who is just a very, as you can see, deranged insane, bonkers cult. And it's so sad because all these people ruined their own lives just because Charles Manson was so good at manipulating them. That's really just what it is. I say Manson is an evil genius and I use the term genius lightly because he was able to manipulate all these people to do all these things for him, whether it was just manipulate the women to have sex or do sexual favors for him or for others or just have people to take drugs so he can manipulate them. It's just insane. He got so many people to do these things for him. He got people to kill others for him. So he never actually killed anyone himself. So he's not technically a serial killer, but he is definitely a very, very sick individual. So all that being said, I want to know what you think about Charles Manson and the Manson family. Kind of crazy what drugs will do to you. Drugs and uh, emotional insecurity. So let me know down in the comments below. I would love to hear your thoughts. If you have anything you'd like to share, if you'd like to input, definitely let me know as well. Now, shout out of the day goes to Jenna on Instagram at thank you so, so much. If you'd like to be shout out of the day, just follow me on my Instagram and stay active. Like I mentioned, this is a brand new series called Zodiac Serial Killers. You can binge more episodes in my Zodiac Serial Killers playlist where I post a new video every first Thursday of the month. So next month, you will get a video on a Sagittarius serial killer. <laughs> let me tell you, I do have one in mind. Name rhymes with Red Rundy, so definitely stay tuned for that one. That one is probably going to be another long video because there is just so much, I don't want to say content, but for lack of a better word right now, just a lot of content and details about. So get ready for that one. But for now, you can go binge more episodes of this or more episodes similar to this content in my spooky videos playlist. But all that being said, I will see you guys next time. So make sure you're subscribed and bye.